Thank you, ladies, for leading us in worship, getting our hearts ready and prepared for this lesson. Well, good morning. It is a beautiful, sunny day at last. Yay. And it is, as Cam mentioned, so hard to believe that we're near the end. It's gone so fast. And I just commend you all. You've been one of the most faithful groups of ladies in all my years of Bible study. So well done. Yes, give yourself a hand. Well, let's pray. Well, as we sing in the previous song before that one, joyful, joyful, we adore thee, God of glory, Lord of love. You are great. The great I am, self-existent, eternal, and unchanging. We are always changing, but you never change. Lord, you declared to Moses in the cloud on Mount Sinai, the Lord, the Lord, a God, merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Lord, Will you help me speak your word for your glory and help us all to receive it with joy, to let it, as Cam mentioned, dwell richly in our hearts. Amen. Well, let's begin with God's word in 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 through 22. But we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction, and that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. See that no one repays another with evil for evil. But always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophetic utterances, but examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good, abstain from every form of evil. This is God's word. Well, I have a favorite plant, and I love this plant because it communicates to me. When it is well watered, its leaves go up and it looks really happy, but when it's thirsty, its leaves go down and it looks really sad. I call it my happy plant because most of all my other plants eventually end up dying. But this plant, I'm guessing, has lasted for almost over 15 years. It has survived. It's an amazing plant. One Christmas, regretfully, I decided to put it in my guest room bathroom. <laughs> it didn't fit the decor of Christmas. And this bathroom has a very small window that doesn't let in a lot of light. Well, it wasn't until after all the hustle and bustle of the Christmas season that I went in and discovered that happy plant wasn't so happy anymore. It almost joined all my other dead plants. <laughs> but this plant was special, so I decided to try to nurse it and cultivate it. I think I put it in a little bit larger pot and some new soil and probably added some miracle growth. <laughs> And it eventually grew again and revived, thrived again. Well, my happy plant is a picture for us, for us as believers to live in the light, being connected to the life of God and to the family of God, receiving the care and cultivation needed to grow in holiness. In our previous lesson, we heard and learned about some dark and heavy matters by Katie. She shared that the doomsday clock is reportedly 90 seconds to midnight. And the future day of the Lord, she also spoke on, a day of fear and judgment for the wicked, but a day that the redeemed can anticipate with hope. Now Paul is bringing us back to present reality of now what? 
How do we live holy lives in light of the day of the Lord? That, in, that is, until Christ returns to receive his sons and daughters home. We do not know when that day will be. It could be tomorrow, Maranatha, as Dawn uh, shared and reminded us, or hundreds and thousands, of, not that I don't know, I hope not that long, but hundreds of years, thousands, maybe thousands of years from now. Well, we want to be women who live in the light of the Lord's presence, walking by the Spirit and growing in His truth. And we need motivation for cultivation, Cultiva cultivating our hearts and our minds as we labor together, care for one another, and study God's Word. God gives us a family so we can walk joyfully together along the path to holiness as we eagerly await the Lord's return. Well, we have some attitudes that need cultivating on our way to heaven. And thankfully, we have assistance. We have leaders. We have one another, brothers and sisters in Christ. And we have God's word, inspired by the Holy Spirit himself, who is our helper to guide us and to grow us. Our relationships in the church body are vitally important in order for the church to be healthy and vibrant and strong. Well, let us first look at our relationship with our leaders in verses 12 through 13. But we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction and that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. Paul is making a request to the brethren. This request is for the members of the church, especially, or especially here referring to fellow believers in Christ who are united by the bond of affection. So first, we're to joyfully cultivate a respectful attitude for your pastors and leaders. It's not an authoritative command, but rather that of a friend making an urgent appeal to a friend. John MacArthur points out, although our text in 1 Thessalonians makes no mention of elders, overseers, or pastors, they are in view of those who had charge over the Thessalonians. So why are we to appreciate our leaders? This term means to know, but here it includes appreciating and respecting them and their work, to know them, to recognize them, be aware of them, and not take them for granted. Paul gives us three reasons why we are to appreciate our pastors and leaders. A, diligently, it's because they diligently labor among you. Being a pastor, an elder, or deacon is hard work. And we've seen this with Paul and his team. They were a perfect model and example to the highest degree. They were servant ministers. We saw this in 1 Thessalonians 2.9. For you recall, brethren, our labor and hardship, how working night and day so as not to be a burden to any of you, we proclaimed to you the gospel of God. Night and day they truly cared. And this applies to our pastors who labor hard in preaching and teaching and counseling. I remember Pastor Philip, I think in sharing this, teaching on this very lesson, said it's like labor. And I think we can all <laughs> relate to that. It's like um, giving birth, you know, we're churning. And I felt a little bit like that myself with this um, text. It's like you're churning, you're meditating, you're learning yourself and, and you're ready to pop that baby out by the time you're done doing all that. It's, it's a lot of work. And so lastly, notice that it's amongst you. A good, loving shepherd knows his flock. He is amongst the church. He's not up on the screen like some of those mega church pastors or leaving as soon as he's done preaching. They know us and we know them. We are to respectfully appreciate our pastors in return. And second, B, our pastors are those who have charge over you in the Lord. This verse is one of many in the New Testament that shows that there was no one man rule in the apostolic church. There was a group of elders, 
in each congregation, pastoring the local flock. And they have charge over you. It literally means those who put or are placed before you or over you, leading you, directing you, protecting you, taking care of their flock. And it's in the Lord. The Lord's appointees are under his authority. Hybert says it this way, his lordship underlies their leadership. Their authority is not that of a formal ecclesiastical hierarchy, but rather it's one exercised in the warmth of Christian bonds. And see, they give you instruction. New theteo, that's the word that we have, and some of you in biblical counseling recognize that word. They give instruction warning, cautioning, gently reproving, exhorting. Exhorting literally means to place in the mind and so to warn or give notice to beforehand, especially to evil. Nuthateo has the connotation of confronting with the intent of changing one's attitudes and actions, and it's in the present tense, which indicates that these leaders were continually admonishing, warning, and cautioning. Acts 20, 31 says, Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish you with tears. Admonishing and giving instruction is a ministry calling for much warmth and closeness. There is no hint of a distant judgmentalism or criticism launched from some height of superior superiority. He, Hebrews 13, 17 says, have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. Not only are we to appreciate our leaders, but we are to esteem our leaders, verse 13, and that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. To esteem them, which means to think rightly and lovingly of them. And A, it's to be very highly, overextend our esteem, to go beyond all measure. And B, in love, the familiar agape love that we have seen over and over in First Thessalonians. It's that selfless, sacrificial service for others. Notice that we esteem them highly in love, not because of their charm or personality, their education or position, or even because of their unique abilities. And uh, not because of their Irish brogue accent either. <laughs> And see, it's because of their work. That's why we esteem them. Our leaders are diligently laboring and working for the church and the Lord Jesus Christ, the chief shepherd and his servants. And we are to hold them in the highest regard. And when we do, the result is at the end of verse 13. There's no division, no church split. We will live in peace with one another. So, number one, we are to joyfully cultivate a respectful attitude for our faithful pastors and leaders. And now, and number two, we're to joyfully cultivate a responsible attitude to care for your church family and all people, verses 14 through 15. Satan the devil is an instigator of sin and sorrow. In the Bible, Satan the devil is revealed as the deceiver, the accuser, the liar, and the hinderer. We've seen that in Thessalonians with Paul being hindered. He blinds the minds of unbelievers and seeks to cloud the believer's mind with reminders of guilt and failure. Satan is a powerful foe, but he's also a defeated one. The very real power of the evil one should only ever be considered in light of the victory of the Lord Jesus Christ. The devil has been chained by the cross of Christ. And that was either Alistair Begg or Spurgeon who said that. I couldn't find, I didn't know, didn't find that note. 
In the light of what was just described about Satan, the devil, the next two verses will take on a whole new meaning. Verse 14, we urge you, brethren, admonish the ruly, unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. And verse 15, see that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. Paul is making an urgent call, urgent, parakaleo, which means to come alongside. Paul is asking, begging, pleading, exhorting, exhorting the spiritually healthy to help the needy, those who are in sin and sorrow. As believers, we can be in any one of these categories at any time, and we need one another. The enemy is on attack in the church. Paul is urging church members to cultivate a caring concern to deal effectively with four groups that need attention, and there's four behaviors. And just because we have amazing pastors and leaders, it does not relieve us of our responsibility to care for one another. This call is for us. And these four present imperatives that we have before us are four opportunities to make these actions our lifestyle as we depend on the enabling supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. First, A, you are to continually admonish Nuthateo again, the unruly. Simply put, those who are out of step with the rest of the crowd, the unruly, the wayward, going their own way, disorderly, or maybe idle. Like a soldier who's out of rank or an army that advances in disarray. We are to admonish them. This is our same word that we saw in verse 12 when our pastors give us instruction and warn us. Let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. That's James 5, 19 through 20. Next, B, you are to continually encourage the faint-hearted. The second group of people that need our help is the faint-hearted, literally, literally meaning little soul. It has nothing to do with mentality. They are those in the church who may lack boldness to step out into ministry, or they may fear change or want to be safe, not wanting to risk being persecuted or suffer for their faith. These individuals aren't on the fringes, they're huddled in the middle. I fell into this category uh, years ago when, um, when the Lord was leading me to start the hospital ministry here at, at Kindred. It was right as Chuck, our founding pastor, was dying and the Lord was just strongly laying it on my heart to begin this. And I ran in one day to one of Chuck's nurses and the Lord prompted me, ask her if there's a need to go visit patients in the hospital. And she said yes. And so then two weeks went by and I ran into this nurse again. And she's like, we need you, you need to get down there. And so I drove to St. Joseph's and I drove away from St. Joseph's. <laughs> I was little soul. And I went home and I called my friend and she's like, we're going down there. And so we went down to the hospital and it was the most amazing experience. We were even hindered, I think, by God this time. The elevator stopped working and we were stuck. We couldn't leave. And uh, the nurse was there again. It happened, she happened to have a night shift. <laughs> and it, that was just how the whole thing began. And it was just such an amazing experience and so I ask you is the Lord asking you to start a ministry or have you heard of a friend you know either ask a friend to help you or be that friend to help someone those little soul people well see moving on you are to continually help the weak to hold firmly is a more precise rendering we are to hold fast Hold firmly the weak and don't let them fall. They are needy people, those in, that are weak in the faith. They need support. They need to grow strong in the Lord. The weak are those who are fragile in the faith and may not have recognized or are not enjoying their liberty in Christ. They are still bound to rules and regulations. 
Galatians 5, 1 says, it is for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing and do not be subject, subject again to a yoke of slavery. The weak may also struggle with abandoning sin and obeying God's will. Therefore, we who are spiritually stronger need to hold them up so they do, so they do not fall. Like a stake holding up a delicate orchid, we need to provide them the doctrinal instruction, encouragement towards righteousness and away from sin. And D, moving on, continually be patient with everyone, often translated long-suffering. Um, it's an attribute of God, a fruit of the Spirit, a characteristic of love. All ministry is not easy, and we need to be patient with everyone. Warren Wiersbe has a great insight. He said, that weaker member who demands much help may one day be a choice leader. And while Wiersbe was talking to a friend after service where he had just spoken, a red-headed boy about 10 years old came running past them and heading up the center of the aisle. His friend remarked, have you ever noticed that the biggest scamps in Sunday school usually turn out to be pastors and missionaries? <laughs> Think of the Apostle Paul, the great Apostle Paul himself, who used to persecute the church. Even as the Lord said, he was persecuting the Lord himself. Well, in my own observation, it's a beautiful thing when the church does not give up on a person, when they support the weak with the love and grace of the Savior, of the Savior. Continual patience is needed with everyone, which leads us nicely into verse 15. See that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and all people. E, continually watch your motives. Isn't it true that some of our most painful experience come not from unbelievers? We expect them to be sinful, but from people from within our own church family, both leaders and members, we all are capable of hurting one another. It could be gossip, slander, unbiblical advice or influence. It could be intimidation, manipulation, or power control. Are there all ways that we can hurt, or worse yet, crush someone's faith? We are exhorted in verse 15 not to respond back to such evil with evil. That's a negative and sinful response. Our response as followers of Christ is not revenge. That is forbidden to the followers of Jesus. In this place, in place of the, these negative attitudes and actions, we are to positively, we are positively instructed to seek after that which is good for one another and for all. Romans 12, 17 through 21 has more on this, um, but the end of 21, it says, do not overcome evil, by, do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. But that whole chapter is worth going and to look because it fits perfectly there. A spiritually healthy and growing church is responsibly cultivating loving concern for their church family and for all people. Well, third, which is on the back of your outline, joyfully cultivate a reverent attitude for worship and his word. Three ways to flourish in our growth and sanctification. A, worship in his will. B, worship in his spirit. And C, worship in his word. So first, uh, A, worship in his will, 16 through 18. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Rejoice always. Paul seems to be exhorting us to public worship. We may not see these verses at first as a call to public worship, but as John Stott points out, all the verbs are plural, so that they seem to de describe our collective and public rather than individual and private Christian duties. In this context then, which suggests that the rejoicing, the praying, and the thanksgiving of verses 16 through 18 are also meant to be expressed when the congregation assembles. 
Dr. Ralph Martin says that these short, sharp commands read like the headings of a church service. Our pastors modeled this, as Cam pointed out, last Sunday. Um, just our verses last Sunday where it says, be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Corporately, together, we are submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Well, how do we continually cultivate these attitudes as a lifestyle of joy and prayer and thanksgiving when life is hard, evil is surrounding us, and the doomsday clock is ticking, family members can be struggling with anxiety and depression. Just this past week, I had a dear one who wanted to end her life, and then just, I think it was a couple days ago, my son called, and someone did take their life. We are living in desperate times, ladies, and um, people need hope, and I'm so thankful to hear that Pastor Philip is gonna be speaking on hope at Easter. It's perfect. But you daughters of the King, you can always rejoice because your joy isn't based on circumstances, but on God, amen? Circumstances change, but your God, he never changes. As you all know, okay, so this is a bright sunny day, but we've been having record-setting rains, haven't we? And just this past week, I was walking um, back to the car after dropping my grandson off to school, and I could have been really mumbling or murmuring, complaining, grumbling. I don't like dark clouds. I don't like being out in the rain, and I don't like cold. <laughs> but after I've been churning on all of this for the past how long, I don't know, the song Singing in the Rain came to mind. <laughs> and when I got home, I listened to Gene Kelly's iconic song and dance performance. The scene before the song was also included, and after the woman kissed Kelly goodnight, she warned him to take care of his voice because the California dew was a little heavier than usual that night. <laughs> and I love Gene Kelly's reply, because he says, really, from where I'm standing, the sun is shining all over the place. And as you know, that, that scene where he's just splashing puddles and he's under the rain gutter and he's singing, he sings, I'm singing in the rain, just singing in the rain. What a glorious feeling, I'm happy again. I'm laughing at clouds so dark up above. The sun's in my heart and I'm ready for love. And I was dancing with him. Like I was in my, <laughs> in my um, living room. It just made me happy because it's a picture of how a genuine believer rejoices in the Lord because the sun, the S-O-N, is in our hearts and we are ready for love no matter what's happening around us. We know, ladies, as we learned last time in 5, 1 through 11, that we belong to the day. We're not in darkness. We're not under God's cloud of wrath. There's no condemnation, no separation between us and our God. We have put on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. As believers in Christ, we will obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we're awake or asleep, we might live with him. And, those, and that's how we're to encourage one another. We're going to live with our Lord forever. Rejoice! <laughs> that's the key. That is the key because we can always rejoice in the Lord the joy of your Lord, of the Lord, is your strength. Does your position in Christ lead you to continually rejoice, pray in everything, and give thanks? If not, you need to examine yourself to see if you're really truly in the faith, or 
if Satan has clouded your vision of Jesus. Spurgeon says that those three texts are the three companion pictures representing the life of a true Christian. He says they are an ornament of grace to every believer's neck. Wear them, every one of you, for the glory and for beauty. Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks. So A, we're to worship in his will, and then B and C, I'm going to combine together, worship in his spirit and worship in his will. Verse 19, do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophetic utterances, but examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Today, much of the evangelical church has minimized the importance of the Holy Spirit and God's word. Cam pointed it out, it fit perfectly with today's text. That was by John MacArthur. And in my own past church experience, the church can be so focused on doctrine and proper theology, they can become like those in Revelation 2 who abandon their first love. And Revelation 2, 4 says, but I have this against you that you have abandoned the love that you had at first. The church was so focused on orthodoxy that they missed what was most important, the agape love of Christ for those that he came to save was abandoned. The church can also become a charismatic, so emotional and experience-driven outside the truth of his word that their desire for the holy word has also been abandoned. It's vital for the health of the church, the body of Christ, to honor his spirit and pay attention to his word. Wearsby says, apart from God's word, we have no certain revelation from the Lord. Worship that ignores the Bible is not spiritual. The Holy Spirit and his word are vital for spiritual growth and sanctification. We need to ask ourselves, Are we spirit-filled Christians? Are we dependent on his inerrant, infallible, and holy word to change us? Is it possible that we're quenching the spirit, grieving the spirit, or resisting the spirit? The spirit can be grieved. We've been learning this in Ephesians 4. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Tony Evans says to grieve the Holy Spirit is like letting corrosion build up on a battery so that the power of the battery cannot be assessed. In the life of a Christian, when the Holy Spirit is grieved, the charge and power available declines and is lost. The Spirit can also be resisted. Uh, You men are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears and always resisting the Holy Spirit. You, do, you are doing just as your fathers did. That's Acts 7, 51. And as we see and have seen in 1 Thessalonians, our text today, the spirit can be quenched. We are exhorted, do not quench the spirit. The command could be paraphrased something like this. Stop putting out the fire of the Holy Spirit. Stop hindering and resisting the Holy Spirit, for in doing so, you are preventing him from exerting his full influence. Whoa, (laughs) we don't want to do that, do we, ladies? But the good news and the comfort for us is the Holy Spirit does not leave us when we fail. He can't, but he cannot fill us or empower us and use us if we neglect our spiritual lives. Believer, you are sealed for the day of redemption. He has permanently come to reside in you, and we are to fan that flame, the gift of God, as we are reminded in 2 Timothy 1, 4 through 6. Well, Alan Roman and I were one evening sitting by a fire pit, There were two fire pits, and we were at this one, and there was another one right over here, and it was a beautiful evening and a light breeze, and our fire pit (laughs) was going on and off, on and off, on and off, and it was irritating, and I'm looking over at this fire pit over here, and it was this big, huge flame, and it was beautiful, and it was kind of like dancing in the breeze, and I'm like, 
I want to be over there. <laughs> but it was taken. And it was just a reminder, isn't it an example for us that don't we want to be near Christians who are full of the Spirit, who are walking in Him and led by Him, who are full of joy and thanksgiving, who see the goodness of the Lord even when it's hard and difficult? Well, as we cultivate a reverent attitude for worship and his word, we are also exhorted to, in verse 20, do not despise, or which means reject or look down on prophetic utterances. The word of God is to be publicly proclaimed and preached, and we are, as a congregation, to desire and to be discerning his word, not despising his word. We are to examine, verse 21, everything carefully, hold fast to that which is good, abstain from every form of evil. Ladies, I hope after today that you don't see these as a list of do's and don'ts, but that you see them with a renewed vision, a new attitude, a new affection for the Lord Jesus Christ and his people, the church body that he came to save. May we joyfully be cultivating as we continue in a continual lifestyle a respectful attitude to love our leaders, a responsible attitude to care for one another and for all people, and a reverent attitude for worship and his will, his spirit, and his word. I love the hymn, and thank you, Lori, for playing the, um, the joyful, joyful, we adore the God of glory. Lord of love, hearts unfold like flowers before the opening to the sun above. Can I encourage you to be that happy flower <laughs> in this dark world? We need joyful Christians that can influence and make a difference for the gospel of Jesus Christ. If there's one thing that I want you to remember, it's to remember that the joy of the Lord is your strength. And you can always rejoice because it's in the Lord. Now, may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. And may, his, uh, may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he who calls you is faithful, and he surely will do it. That's next time. Barbara's going to teach us deeper in those verses, and so um, we'll look forward to digging into them next time in our last lesson. And so may you just go in the joy of the Lord. You are dismissed.